All right, time. I think we will get started. I'm not sure, given that we're running over exactly when we're supposed to get started, but we're just gonna run with it. Um, so thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Heather West. Uh, I am at Venable and I work with the Alliance for Trust in AI. Uh, and I am thrilled to be here today uh, to talk about intelligent threats, understanding AI's impact on cybersecurity policy. Um, I think, you know, our goal is to talk about how AI is impacting cybersecurity policy and practice, uh, but also what we're seeing out in the world. Um, so there's been a lot of discussion about AI and cybersecurity since the last State of the Net. There's been discussion this morning. Uh, there's, everyone's talking about AI in the hallway. So, it, you know, it is, it is where we all need to be and what we're talking about. Um, so today we'll talk about, you know, are AI tools super powering cyber attacks? Are AI tools making it easier to protect people? Can we protect AI from itself? Can we protect it from other attackers? Uh, can, can we just replace our security team with AI armies? See, that sounds fun. Um, so we'll dive in with our fantastic panel. I'm really excited to be here today. Um, these are my favorite panels where it's just me and a bunch of friends chatting. Um, and a big thanks to the State of the Net team for putting this together. Um, so today we have Charlie Snyder, uh, who's the head of security policy at Google, Alyssa Starzak, the vice president and global head of public policy at Cloudflare, Austin Carson, the founder and president of Seed AI, and Grace Abuhama, the chief of staff at the National Telecommunications and Information Administration. So uh, let's dive in. There's been, that is, that is the page I just looked at. Um, so we've been talking breathlessly about AI for a year. Uh, we all kind of know that AI isn't just chatbots, <laughs> but apparently it's working against me. Um, and, and we should just dig in. So Alyssa, can you start us off by talking a bit about how AI is used in cybersecurity? Big question. Thanks, Heather. And uh, now I can't get my hand. Thanks, Heather. And thanks for having me today. By the way, I think the fact that Heather's uh, microphone dropped when she was talking about AI armies may <laughs> tell you something about what's going on in the world. But no. Um, so, you know, I think the reality of where we are with AI is that AI has been around for a long time. Um, the thing that, that is relatively new um, and that came out in the past year is the sort of democratization of AI with things like large language models. So when you think about that, um, you know, practically, it's just changed the world a little bit. Um, not because we haven't had concepts of AI and cybersecurity, but because of who has access and what that then means. So, um, you know, we've used, we, I'm at Cloudflare. Um, Cloudflare, if you don't know us, um, we run a lo very large global network. Um, we sit in front of something like 20% of the world's websites. Um, that is a ton, a ton of traffic uh, that, that runs through our network on a daily basis. The only way we can actually think about managing that is with AI. There's too much, there's too much data, there's too, there are too many sort of mechanisms um, that have to happen in real time to do things in a purely automated way. You have to think about applying either machine learning initially or, or now AI um, to it. So what does that mean in practice? It means you have to have systems that sort of anticipate uh, patterns. Um, and can then adapt uh, in real time. And that's really kind of what AI gets used for in cybersecurity on sort of a traditional basis. Again, the thing that has changed over the course of the past year since the release of ChatGPT is this idea that people can use AI themselves. So think about what that means for an enterprise all of a sudden, right? Now every enterprise, and I'm sure we'll talk about this, wants to use AI tools. Well, now you have new supply chain attacks if you're thinking about it from a cybersecurity angle. You have to worry about the cybersecurity of those tools. You have to worry about your employees who think, hey, this chat GPT thing is super cool. Um, I can use, write it, all my emails with it. And all of a sudden, putting sort of sensitive information into external applications where they're not actually thinking about where that information goes or, or where it could end up. So the world has changed, um, not because AI is necessarily a new thing, but because who has access to it and what that means from a cybersecurity risk standpoint. Thanks. Uh, so, so to build on that, Charlie, can you talk a little bit more about, about what's changing for cybersecurity? Yeah, sure. So I you know, agree with everything Alyssa said. You know, I would say to, to build on it a little bit, you know, what we see as new is uh, you know, these generally capable 
you know, uh, systems that can accept and uh, spit out natural language um, is one thing that's very new. And putting that very close to the consumer uh, or enterprise through, through a UI is, is rather new. Um, and then increasingly, we're seeing how users start to use that, how users start to drive the technology in various directions. So think um, using it almost like an operating system. This is something people are starting to talk about, where you're plugging into this, uh, where, where a chatbot has plugins to do various things with other systems, maybe over the internet, maybe within your network. Um, using it as a development platform. So starting to uh, integrate these capabilities to help write code, help review code, things like that. Um, obviously, uh, you know, Alyssa touched on some of the risks that come with that, and I have a feeling we're going we're gonna to dig in deeper there. Um, I would say for, for security on the positive side uh, at Google, and then the way we think about it for you know, our customers and, and the internet more broadly, you know, we're looking at how we can use these capabilities, these things I mentioned, you know, a, you know, a natural language interface, um, integrating it with other systems uh, in ways to completely transform our approach to security. And so you can think of security as um, sort of a life cycle. There's, there's you know, detecting threats and, and vulnerabilities, and there's, uh, there's uh, you know, discovering vulnerabilities which, are, uh, which can be uh, exploitable, then there's writing. Uh, safer code, there's patching the code that you might, that an AI system might find uh, that's vulnerable. Then there's kind of, you know, post-breach, there's incident response, can it help responders interact with uh, AI systems to, to help them respond more speedily. You could think of it as a, as a huge life cycle, and I think we're pretty busy seeing all the different places that these systems can, can fit in uh, and, and provide value. So what I'm hearing from the industry side is AI is everywhere. <laughs> We're just starting to see it more uh, for the rest of us a little bit. And I, th I do think that that was fairly transformative. Um, and, and so, Austin, I know that you're taking a bit of a different tack. Your red teaming work has really broadened what we're thinking about as potential risks and, and security risks for AI. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Mm -hmm. um, so, I'm going to just take a hard left on that for okay. fun. So, I mean, in listening to everybody talk about uh, the application of AI to cybersecurity and in thinking about the transition from like artificial intelligence as like deep learning, you know, from like 2012 big deep learning explosion to generative AI to chat GPT, I think um, you make a very good point that it is closer and closer to the consumer. It's about touching people. But most importantly, in my view, it's about taking kind of the fuzzy math that humans retained an advantage on until very recently and moving that into computation, right? So we've taken, it, we've taken everything that was just like one plus one equals two, and then we've computed all of that we can, and now we're in the part where we're computing like probabilities, right? If you look at what cybersecurity is, it's the part of computing that already is in the probabilities. It already is in fuzziness. It already is in like unexplained, un inexplicable breakages throughout the entire system. And so if you think about what it means to add that extra probability layer, much more effective at stopping things, much more effective at doing things. And the failure mode for most cybersecurity issues is human in nature. It's about the spear phishing email. It's about doing something stupid and downloading the wrong app. Right, so that's gonna be a huge vulnerability. <clears throat> and that's part of why we have gone towards this like red teaming big picture approach. Because the only way you're gonna capture this like massive level of failures that are implicit across any system now that you have this fuzzy math and human interaction with AI is having huge participation in it. Yeah. And so from our perspective, driving that is like one of the number one things you can do. Yeah, and we'll talk a little bit more about red teaming uh, later because I think it's so interesting. But, but bringing so many people together to see, ooh, what can I, what can I break? What, what, what doesn't work quite right? You know, that's a traditional approach in cybersecurity, uh, but, but applied a little bit differently. Um, so, so Grace, as the relationship between security and AI evolves, uh, the US government and NTAA are doing a ton of work on this. I know, like, from my perspective, the AI EO is like full employment. Um, <laughs> and, and it's a lot of really, really interesting stuff. Uh, can you talk about your work on accountability and then some of the, the work on risks and benefits of open dual use foundation models? Yes. Lots of buzzwords that Lots, are yes. kind of terrible government buzzwords. <laughs> Yeah, so there's two big initiatives that we're working on at NTA. One of them is EO related. One of them existed, or we started before the EO. Um, I'll talk about the the one that we the AI accountability work because that pre preceded the EO and is 
um, relevant to this conversation in the sense that what we were looking at when, um, when Assistant Secretary Davidson came in, one of the big questions we asked is sort of like, how can we help move the field? Um, and there's a little bit of a link because we're in the middle of a big um, broadband deployment across the United States. You might have heard about it. And part of that involves, you know, it's a long grant program, but we have to be building a movement for once people are, one, you know, once we build the infrastructure, we're going to have all these people online. We're thinking about the online space differently as it's evolving over time. And as part of that, we were also thinking, where can we apply those that sort of internet policy work to other areas that are not just broadband infrastructure. AI policy is one of them. Today is the 10 year anniversary of the release of the uh, NIST cybersecurity framework. It's actually it's perfect timing in some ways, but there's been a whole decade or more, you could say you know, longer, probably 15, 20 years of work to build a cybersecurity field and ecosystem, businesses that, have cre that are created specifically to work on cybersecurity, et cetera. And you could see that evolving with the AI space as well. So part of what we tried to do when we launched our AI accountability work was think about what do we want the AI accountability ecosystem to look like? And that includes what do we want, you know, what are we going to need in terms of workforce? What are we going to need in terms of audits across sectors? What are we going to need in terms of access to data or, or, or not, et cetera? So that's the report that we started working on a couple of years ago. It's coming out soon. Um, and that's sort of the work that we, we started doing before the executive order came out. Um, in the executive order, there was we were given one specific assignment. And that assignment is to look at the risks and benefits of dual use foundation models with widely accessible model weights. Um, that's, that's a very specific task in the sense that the definition of the dual use foundation model, which is in the executive order, really applies to to very large uh, models. And right now there's only like a handful of them that we really, we can think about in that case. Um, and then the question of model weights, again, focuses really specifically on, on a type of risk that, or a, t or a, a component that we're looking at um, evaluating. So we have a request for comment coming out soon on that as well. Happily take, you know, comments on all aspects, but the, the task itself is really, really quite narrow. And we can come back to that in a little bit okay. more detail as to why that's the case. But um, I think, you know, and when we're thinking about the cybersecurity risk to AI, there's a lot more that we can be, there, there are a lot more that, there's a lot more that we could be thinking about in the immediate term than some of the larger scale risks that the EO is trying to address. It's trying to do both large scale potential risk and then sort of immediate and different parts of the government are addressing different pieces. So we have this one task that's quite specific and a little bit more focused on the, the larger scale risk. Great, thank you. So let's talk about that a little bit more, some of, some of the cyber risks that come with this explosion of AI um, and particularly the explosion of widely accessible, really interesting AI. Um, Alyssa, Cloudflare, you were, you were saying, sees so much of the internet. Um, and, and all of the interactions that are happening. Can you, can you talk about any trends that you can trace to the use of AI? You know, I, I, th I think the funny thing, you know, here we are talking about AI and the sort of world, the new world of AI. You know, but, but honestly, from a cybersecurity standpoint, the biggest risk I think we all face are the sort of pre-existing risks. Um, the fact that people don't do um, sort of basic cybersecurity. Um, the thing that AI does, um, is actually power that. It makes them easier to find. It makes vulnerabilities easy, easier to find. It makes something like a, um, a phishing email a lot better. Um, so now uh, you don't see the errors in it. Um, so, so the very, I, th I think the biggest thing that we're seeing right now is not the really sophisticated you know, change in model weights that, that might sort of influence something long-term. It's very much the sort of basics, right? We have to fix the basics. Um, and AI sort of supercharges everything that we end up um, worrying about because it makes it easier to find the, the challenges. It makes it easier to find the problems. Got it. Charlie, a similar question. I, I'm interested in what you're actually seeing, the, the risk being. I think, Alyssa, it makes sense to me that, that all of the things that were vulnerabilities before are still vulnerabilities. Um, what, are, what is Google seeing in terms of malicious AI and attacking AI? Yeah, I, th I think at a at a high level, uh, what we've seen so far is uh, you know it has the potential to lower the barrier to entry to for less skilled adversaries, 
uh, people who want to do harms online. I think we're very interested in seeing uh, how it can be adapted in the future uh, for, for more skilled adversaries as well. Um, but at a, at a high level, you know, information operations, we are seeing uh, uh, organizations start to make use of LLMs to generate essentially, you know, inauthentic content, propaganda and the like. Uh, I think for the most part, uh, it has been quite ineffective. We don't see it having a, a huge, huge impact. Um, but I think that's obviously one area where LLMs are, are well suited uh, to generate content in a specific language uh, that may be more persuasive uh, than, you know, someone who's not, you know, a, a native language of that speaker would otherwise be. Uh, in terms of hacking and intrusion operations, really quite limited. Um, we, we see it used in kind of the first stage of an operation. So generally like the social engineering, which again relies on kind of natural language for persuasion, um, things like fueling phishing attacks. I think, you know, Alyssa made my point for me. I think at, at Google, we consider, you know, password phishing, for instance, largely a solved problem um, for organizations that are serious about it. It's, it is not a problem organizations should be having in 2024, let alone 2023 or 2022. And uh, for consumer services, you know, multi-factor authentication is largely available for free as well. Um, and so uh, I think it's important for us to be like really crisp on the details of um, are, are these presenting kind of new threats or just exploiting old things that we still haven't fixed. I think for the most part, it's in that second category, but we're really interested in our, um, you know, kind of an open call to the community, to governments, to other companies, interested to the degree to which adversaries are using it for other parts of their operations, you know, malware development, um, uh, you know, general reconnaissance, things like that. Um, you know, the, the social engineering part is, is the most visible. And again, I don't think we've seen it um, being, you know, all that much of a game changer. Yeah, if I can make one suggestion, what I find in talking, especially to like security researchers and just kind of observation is that uh, the reason that it's like that is because we have such an insane breadth of old problems, right? Like a crazy amount of old problems that we just didn't touch. It's kind of like content on the internet. It's just a burning pile of trash and we're slapping LLMs on top of it in hopes that it makes it less trash and then like not training on the internet after 2021 because everything after GPT-3 happened is trash, you know? And so we're trying to like repair- Tell us what you really think. Uh, have you checked the internet since 2021? Um, I think on like a fundamental level, uh, what scares me is that you see like uh, really normal spear phishing things over and over again. And then you see a website with like four zero days strung together that remotely takes over everyone's iPhone that's associated with the Uyghurs, you know? And uh, I really am concerned that pretty much around the table in all of these areas of software and maybe like society too, you know, but software most immediately that we haven't addressed. We have like lurking massive vulnerabilities that we're all just kind of chilling on because we're waiting for everybody to do multi-factor authentication, you know? So like, I don't know exactly what I'm recommending in terms of a policy prescription, but it is kind of why I ended up at this like mass public participation because we need like a randomizer, honestly. Like if you don't care about people, care about the randomizer and we don't have enough compute for simulating it out right now, right? Um, but in all seriousness, I, um, I don't know, I kind of encourage everybody that talks about this to at least point at the fact that we, and no shade, but at least point at the fact that we ultimately do have this like lurking super capability for hacking, uh, even just at like the most basic levels, even at the metasploit level, you know, anyways. Um, Grace, I know NTIA is an operating internet infrastructure, but, but you're kind of the, the tech policy hub for the US government. Um, I'm, I'm kind of interested what you're hearing, especially as you get ready to release this RFC, or like, and, and talking about accountability, which feels more bread and butter if we're gonna just double down on the, the pieces that we already know how to do and that we already know are issues. Um, what kind of concerns are people bringing up for you? Um, you know, the concerns aren't, the concerns aren't that, that different than the ones that we've heard about over many years, right? People are still concerned about privacy. Um, and whether or not they're going to have some sort of consumer empowerment over their data or protections around their data and its use. Um, we're still hearing a lot about, of course, about competition and access and what that means in this space, what it means to, um, I mean, at the bigger, bigger philosophical level, like what democratization really means and for whom. Um, 
we focus on the US primarily, but we do have a lot of international cooperation that we have to build out and think about in this context. And I was at um, Silicon Flatirons a few weeks ago, or was it last week? I can't remember. <laughs> um, and the, one of the panelists talked about, you know, how these systems are being deployed in Southeast Asia and Africa, and there isn't really enough of an ecosystem there to even think about sort of, one, whether people will be able to really use these tools for all the wonderful benefits that we talk about here, but then also um, have any sense of control or protection over the information, how those systems are used. So big questions like that, right? But then, and then practically even just with, with for us, you know, what does it mean for our ecosystem in the US um, competition with companies um, in the United States? Uh, how, it, how we're going to develop sort of um, a strong research community and attract researchers from around the world to work on AI systems here. Um, and then more recently than I think in the past, more than other NTI issues that we've worked on, we've heard a lot more about harassment and um, questions about gender harassment. You know, I read a report that uh, something like 75% of women in the world now consider consider how much online hate they're going to get before running for office or considering any kind of public facing role. And so as much as we're trying to encourage people to be more active in public life or more active in all kinds of things, we also don't really realize some of the impacts that people are facing online. Same thing with, you know, in the past couple of months, um, Arab American uh, hatred or that's sort of rampant and rising um, anti-Semitism, again, huge problem. Um, so, so big questions like that. We have um, an initiative right now that we're working on with um, Kids Online Health and Safety, and that we're, we're co-leading a task force with um, HHS. And that's you know a whole different stream of work, but again, uh, the AI impacts are there too. A lot of young children, children, teenagers using systems, thinking about, you know, as they're developing and not really sort of conscious of yet of how much um, some of these algorithms are affecting their mental health and well-being and development. So some of these issues are not new or not unique to AI, but they're very much at the center of some of the work that we're doing on tech policy at NTI. Got it. I think that's a resounding round of it's the same issues yeah. that we've been talking about here for years. But faster. Uh, but bigger. Faster. Faster, 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 bigger, more, more accessible, and it also writes poems about my dog. Um, <laughs> Does it make you, it makes you miss the Nigerian prince? <laughs> Unclear. Uh, like that. No? Well, no. I would actually say that this is like the hyper version of the Nigerian prince because the Nigerian prince is a self-selection device. It's written really crappily because it's supposed to identify people dumb enough to fall for it. Now you have eight tiers of Nigerian prince <laughs> tuned towards like the bottom eight tiers of, so of really gullibility. Get, like, prince charming. That's what I'm saying. Oh, but like mildly coded in like charming. a very realistic like <laughs> Facebook <laughs> avatar and Instagram streams and all this stuff. Like we're falling into hyper version of what we were already doing before. Yeah. And I think to this idea of like uh, the kids don't know how much they're being manipulated. Y'all, we know way less than the kids. We were raised on this like absolutely bullshit idea that we were immaculate and like unmanipulatable, like individually responsible entities, right? And so we sit around on the internet all day as like adults acting like we know how to filter information, but that is a hilarious lie. And so I think if anybody actually needs to be like humbled about what we know, it's kind of us. You know what I mean? Like the kids are all right, guys. We're kind of fucked. You know, there, there, there's some truth to that. I think, I think it's actually, I don't, I don't know who else watched the Super Bowl last night, but the number of times the group of folks in my living room pointed at the TV and said, is that AI? Like it was non-trivial. There was at least 10 times. And, and you know, like there's SpongeBob sitting up there in the commentator uh, booth and someone's like, is that AI? And they're like, no, SpongeBob is really the, what? <laughs> um, so, so, but we're talking about like kind of the history of some of these discussions before AI was the buzzword. Um, we're talking about how this this kind of harkens back to all of the the, the problems that we've thought about deeply. Um, one of the things that this makes me think of is is the discussions about open source um, and how democratization of tools and security really. Um, it has been a part of this discussion for decades, and I'm a big open source fan, but the AI piece of this puzzle kind of changes the discussion a little bit. Um, how are you all thinking about defending against something that's so widely available and powerful and turbocharged? Open question. 
start my RFC for me. Yeah. <laughs> That's well, true. I mean, my main thing is I like how Grace downplayed that she has like the most important task. Like we have this like little thing about like dual use foundation <laughs> models that have publicly available model weights. I was like, oh, you mean uh, whether or not the foundational technology we have is available for people or not? <laughs> To play with, yeah, that's a small. But I mean, like, whether or not the model weights are available is pretty critical from every level, right? Like, there is no aspect of this technology that is not fairly equivalently dual use, and what that means is it cuts exactly as positively as it does negatively. It's exactly as helpful as it could be harmful, right? And so, like, uh, I think encryption is kind of the best analog that most of us know and deal with, right? When NTIA and everybody else is done playing with encryption, people like lived and died over encryption effectively. Like Bruce Schneier was like, I can solve this. I can ship this book with printed out encryption overseas. So like, there's kind of this hilarious thing where we think we're going to stop open source distribution of like model weights for like research like that in mass without there being like a really good widely agreed upon idea. But all know Bruce Schneier are going to print those out and mail them across the ocean. So it's like, um, we still have to cope with the fact that software is inherently free. Right. And that means we have to create like ecosystems and um, kind of movements and networks and platforms that are designed to support like a, um, a more positive overall movement of the ecosystem, but also in general, like increasing kind of like the validation of the value proposition of open source. You know, the value prop of open source is that it makes things safer and more secure and the whole community can work on it and you can fork it off into like a better version of it, it can become a standard. You know, so I think like if having model weights on the Internet makes that happen we'll probably not really have as much of a problem with model weights being available because we will continuously demonstrate that it's like cyber Pearl Harbor. We'll always talk about how the model weights being there could destroy the world, but they'll never destroy the world, right? Um, if somehow we screw that up in a way I don't understand and don't anticipate, then we'll have cyber Pearl Harbor. And we'll be like, oh, damn, we knew it was going to happen eventually, you know? <laughs> uh, so I think Grace has like one of the hardest tasks. Like, do we take this technology that half the people in the world pretend is God and like uh, put it on the internet? Uh, so that you can not guess what it does, or do we not put it there so we're just guessing what it does from now on? I think it might be worth, before we start talking about the, the, the likelihood, the probability of the cyber Pearl Harbor, which we can ask AI about, um, we'll have its own version. But um, I, it's, it's worth sort of stepping back and thinking what AI is and does and what the different pieces are of AI. Because um, you have, you know, a lot of the, the emphasis, the public discussion has been around training models, right? So um, how much compute power do you need to train a model? Um, you know, there aren't that many entities with that much computing power. What does that look like? A small number of, of, of you know, very small number of, of companies that actually have that kind of uh, computing power. But if you think about sort of what the st stages are of AI, you have um, the, 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 the training of the model, but then you also have the, the questions of deployment and, and then building on it. So, and the, the, the open source, the, 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 um, the, the weight of the model, right? So what goes out there? We, um, we don't train uh, at Cloudflare, we don't train our own models um, for things that are um, sort of generally available. Um, but we do what's called AI inference. So the um, the notion that you can put a model on our edge and do something that's close to an end user, which also requires a lot of actually networking power, right? Because you need, if you want to do an AI decision that's close to a user, um, you need a big network to do that uh, typically, or you need to do it on a device. Um, and so there are all these questions that come up about how you would actually go about democratizing AI, um, what it means for for software to be open, right? It's not they're not just it's not just a given the way software might be. It can't run on everything. Mm -hmm. Has to train on something bigger. It has to run on a bigger network, um, and so we've been trying to do a lot of thinking about what that means um, because there are all sorts of different stages that you could potentially regulate, um, or that you could potentially sort of think about risks on. Um, do you think about the risks on the training? Do you think about the risks on the deployment when you get to a model? Do you think about the model weights? Um, and so, really, kind of being thoughtful about what that looks like um, and thinking about deployment, um, I think matters and will matter in the ultimate outcome, which hopefully is not um, cyber. <laughs> well, let, me, let, me, let me clarify something. One of the cyber Pearl Harbor thing is mostly a riff on like uh, a lot of people say that open source model waste being online is going to cause like bioterrorism and all these things. And it's like you can logically extrapolate out how that could be the case, but you can also logically extrapolate out how Russia should have turned off our power grid like a decade ago. You know what I mean? And I think that's where we're coming from. But just to clarify, like open source model weights available on the Internet. Right now, GPT-4 and ChatGPT live behind an API wall. There's a bunch of magic that happens behind there that you don't see, and who knows exactly what it is. But it seems like you're putting a query into one model, and it spits it out. But there are like the open source versions of this, which are like, you may have heard somebody talk about like Mistral, or you may have heard, of course, of Llama 2, which is Facebook's model, which like 
proliferated out into the universe and made open source large language models effectively exist. I'm sorry, Stella, if you're here, I know. Um, but uh, like the ability to see them means that you can calculate the math. You can understand much more this black box, this explainability, you can at least do the math version of it. If you can't like, uh, like reverse engineer what the math means to words, you can at least math it, right? Um, so like one key experiment that shows you why this matters Right, is that uh, I think it was Stanford, probably God knows, but they had they were using like Llama 2 and they were using OpenAI and they did like uh, 10,000 or 20,000 conversations. So they like asked a thing and got a response. At the end of the study, they're like, well, we could look at the how the um, like how the input went through the model weights and how like lights up the little thing, plinkos it, however you want to visualize it. And um, we could see that its internal state was actually what it said it was doing. It wasn't lying to us or making stuff up. With GPT-4, I mean, we kind of got a guess. Seems like it's not lying to us. So there's this thing where like, um, if you're concerned about what AI is actually doing, on one hand, you wanna be able to see the model weights for yourself so you can kind of know what it's doing. On the other hand, if you can see how the engine runs, you can like make a most powerful engine. So people are trying to like kind of hide how the engine works. You can decide if that's good or bad. The, the one point I'd make on open source is, is really just the need for a holistic approach to governance here. The difference between, or, or policy approaches to closed source are directly linked to what we're gonna see in open source. Policy approaches to regulating models above a certain compute threshold is going to have direct impact on what folks are doing to develop models below that threshold. Um, and so, you know, for me, it's, uh, it's very important as we're, you know, I think the horse has kind of left the barn a little sooner on, you know, we think compute above this, you know, threshold requires X, Y, and Z. I think that has probably directly led to folks investing more in developing models below that threshold. And I think ditto with, with access to open source. Um, if for instance, let's just take the positive view. If organizations cannot easily adopt, you know, closed proprietary source models for, for any particular reason, they're going to invest more in open source. And that's where we're gonna see experimentation. Um, so when you look at attackers doing that, um, you have to look at, you know, attacker access to uh, proprietary. And, and so that, you know, gets into things like, you know, know your customer rules and things like that. That's going to directly drive the market for, for uh, experimentation with open source models. Um, and I think it's just important that we keep that, keep that in mind and have that kind of balanced approach. Yeah. I'll just add one. So if, if a few points to what was already said. The, um, I mean, we, were, we, we, we joke about it here, but we can't take the risk of a cyber Pearl Harbor lightly in government, right? So, <laughs> yeah, I think it so we've been talking about it too long for no. God's sake. Yes, but, so, but the other piece here is that we, you mentioned Mistral, for example, right? The, um, the executive order defines, or in the definition of dual use foundation model, there's sort of three key pieces to the definition. It's a longer definition, but the, there's three key pieces. One of them is that the model has to have more than tens of billions of parameters. So they're very large in that definition, right? They have to be applicable across a wide range of contexts. So they're not um, uh, like a, you know, like a facial, facial recognition system wouldn't be applicable here, right? Um, Mistral wouldn't be applicable because Mistral is only 7 billion parameters. Mm -hmm. um, so, so there's, and then, and then there, the third piece is that you have to be, the, the models, would be posing a serious risk to national security, um, public health, uh, some combination of sort of a large risk that could be anticipated there. There's information to, to indicate that there could be. So in this case, right, there's a lot of sort of nervousness and understandably so about what it means to have access or not to model weights. But in the particular task, we're really looking at a very specific set of, of types of models, right? Very specific type of model. And that does create the incentives that you were talking about, Charlie, where now you see there's a ton of movement in the space to build smaller models, models that use uh, less compute because of access to compute issues, right? And because of sort of the anticipated or the, the sort of indication or the theory behind some of how anyone would read or interpret um, the actions in the EO. I think in part, I don't want to give NTI too much credit, but maybe the reason why NTI was assigned to this particular task is because, you know, within the U.S. government, we have, and across sort of tech policy history here, we have a, a reputation of really thinking hard about 
what it means to make sure that um, there's access to systems, open access, open software, et cetera. We released a report last year on uh, mobile app ecosystem competition. That wasn't a very popular report um, with, with two particular companies, but it was an important question to ask. And I think a lot of people hadn't really thought about that question, about whether or not we needed to have more than two app developers in for, for mobile app technology. So, you know, we're, we're looking at all the options are on the table. We're looking at everything. We're hoping that this uh, RFC will yield lots of plentiful comments. And um, we're taking the report seriously. It's due in July. So, you know, the sooner we get the RFC out, the sooner we get the report, the comments in, the faster we can get that report out. I will say it's been very impressive to watch people actually hit the deadlines in the EO. Um, it is moving fast. Oh, yeah. And there's, I don't know if anyone saw the EO came out with, they, they came out with a 90-day update um, last week, I think it was, January 26th. One of the tasks in there was for the nine critical infrastructure agencies to do risk assessments of the risks posed by AI systems, and those were all complete. So um, that's a really sort of, that's the beginning of also understanding within the government, the federal government, what we think of risk, of, of the different risks of these systems and how we're going to be thinking about them in Got the it. context of the EO. Thank you. So, so to, to, to shift a little bit here, um, Charlie, I know Google spends a lot of time thinking about how to secure Google, but you're also spending a lot of time thinking about developers and customers that are building their own products, services, infrastructure. Um, can AI tools help the ecosystem? Very nice question. Thank you for that. Um, I mean, it's mildly leading. <laughs> we're long-term optimists about this technology. And, you know, I think when we look at, you know, kind of uh, adversarial dynamics online, I think we hope uh, AI will at worst have a neutral impact and at best have a positive impact for people. Um, and I think there's kind of two main kind of drivers where we think that could be the case. Um, you know, you know, one, I think to a point that you know, Austin made earlier, um, so many of the breaches we see, in fact, I, I would argue probably every single breach uh, that we, we've ever seen uh, comes down to humans inability to deal with complexity. I think uh, the, the online ecosystem, both, um, you know, the amount of network services and, and products, as well as the complexity of, of software itself has just gotten too complex uh, to handle. So. And whether that's for a, a developer or a sysadmin or you know a user just trying to manage their exploding inbox, um, basically every breach in the world uh, comes down to that. And you know AI's ability to you know reason and, and learn uh, rapidly and at scale offers a lot of potential to address that kind of root cause of so many of so many breaches. Um, and then the other, and, and related to that, is, uh, you know, we've started talking a lot, and I think we need more research to play this out, but kind of AI being the, the great equalizer. And, um, you know, kind of emerging research that uh, LLMs can help, uh, you know, skilled professionals a little bit, but it helps unskilled professionals a lot. And uh, when I look at, like, attackers versus defenders online, um, you know, I think attackers by their nature maintain at least a tiny bit of capability and intent, even if we would call them very low skilled. There's plenty of organizations that don't have a single IT professional, don't have a single, you know, cybersecurity professional. And I think if we can incorporate uh, this technology in a smart way, which is not to say like everyone should buy like a new, you know, our newfangled AI product, but embed it in kind of the ecosystem through the widely used platforms and and services and systems everybody uses, I think it could have this great leveling ability and take care of this kind of low hanging fruit. Um, so, you know, of course, you know, Google, we have both, you know, consumer business as well as enterprises and, and we're absolutely, um, you know, starting to see how AI can help these organizations, both, make, uh, both baking it into the consumer platforms to help them. And that's kind of something we've been doing for for a very long time in, in places like Gmail, but then also offering kind of technology to organizations, whether that's to you know, help them manage threats better, write more secure code, uh, and, and what have you. And, and the last thing I would say on you know, a reason I'm an optimist here is because I think attackers have a lot of advantages online right now. Uh, one advantage I do think the defensive community has is data. I think they've always had it. So, you know, the cybersecurity companies, big tech companies, um, 
it, they've always had kind of access to better data sets than attackers. Um, the problem has been, you know, dealing with and managing that data. And now that we have this ability to turn data into models, into software to help organizations, as long as we can keep developing that technology to aid uh, organizations for defensive purposes, I think that could be really beneficial for the, for the ecosystem. Got it. Uh, Alyssa, how are you thinking about protecting your own AI systems? Yeah, you know, I think, um, so this gets into a little bit of the open source, you know, we, we use some of our own systems for, uh, for AI, so for protection of others. Um, so if you think about what we do, um, we offer essentially a set of cybersecurity services that sit on top of uh, a lot of, of entities' infrastructure. So it might be going into your internal networks, it might be um, going to your website, uh, a lot of things that sort of sit on top. But the things that we can use AI for, uh, um, we can actually start looking for um, patterns of, of exploits, essentially. Um, so imagine now you have a vulnerability. Um, everybody knows about it. Fine. Um, everyone, you, people go at the vulnerability the same way. That's really easy. That's not AI, right? That's just a basic rule. You know what you're doing. Now think about, if you think about that same set of, of mechanisms of going in, and you start seeing it in an area that's an unknown vulnerability. That is a way of teaching, if a system can identify those patterns, it can actually find a new vulnerability potentially that you might have not even known could be exploited. And that's a world where AI has a huge potential long-term benefit where you can actually block something that is a vulnerability before you even knew it was a vulnerability. And that's huge, right? Um, or think about, um, think about uh, you know, uh, phishing emails, business email compromise, right? That, this sort of concept. You can do the same thing. We're talking about improvements of a phishing email. But the AI system is going the other way, um, where you're not just looking for, you know, sort of very well-known fish kits, but you're looking for sort of probability that this actually might be malicious. Um, and, you know, going to Austin's point about what AI ultimately is and saying, hey, if it's more than a certain probability, there's going to be additional checks on it. Th those are huge potential developments that have both the consumer um, benefits and the enterprise benefits in the long run. Um, and, and, and to Charlie's point, I think they are democratizing, right? Um, they're easily available to everyone, potentially. You can have a small business that doesn't have an IT, uh, an, an IT uh, somebody who's, who even runs their IT staff that can actually get access to them, potentially. So there are some huge long-term cybersecurity benefits, I think, um, in, for, for AI. Um, but we have to figure out how we harness them well. Um, the, the other thing I would add, just on the, the sort of long-term benefits, you know, we often talk about sort of insecure code and vulnerability. It's like the reality of having an AI system help you write more secure code um, doesn't mean it's writing it and you trust it wholesale, um, but the ability of it to do the first um, cut at it is huge. Uh, you can, you, you know, we talking to sort of uh, very senior cybersecurity researchers, they're like, we're not going to have this problem. We're not going to have insecure code in a few years because AI is going to going to identify and help us cure those vulnerabilities. And again, those are just long-term potential benefits, I think, that we see. Um, that's not quite the same as protecting our own, but... Uh, no, but, but... Yeah. Yeah. So there's two things that I think will be really cool here that are interesting, like the classic cat and mouse game, you know? Like, all right, they find a vulnerability, we fix a vulnerability, we anticipate when we fix it. It's going to change into kind of like a different two-sided thing of like who can think about the wackier thing to have AI use and who can think of the way for AI to like fuzz through all your existing code and, and fix everything. I know Google just released a report about going through repairing like 17% of Part of your code base using a buzzer it's like um those black swan events we're kind of talking about are like what if people finally exploit any of our vulnerabilities at scale like this is our opportunity to jump in and use these tools to do what to your point humans could never ever do right and then start having your cybersecurity professionals who are going through and like uh, fixing your your spear phishing email thing if you're at a regular norma corporation or like you know <laughs> fixing your massive back end most sophisticated ml <laughs> model ever for spam filter at Google, right? Um, and instead, there's also like some really creative people who are like, okay, well, the next spear phishing email is going to be something from your mom about your sister's birthday and something about your dog. And they're going to try to extract all the information that's normally used to form your passwords and then cobble them together into a pack. You know, I don't know, I made that up on the spot. There's definitely more creative, <laughs> interesting people than me out here. You Fishing know I mean? Mad Libs. Yeah, you know, like whatever. <laughs> Just like there's kind of like a wacky job that should exist in the world now called like the trying a bunch of stuff guy, you know, where it's just like every company needs like kind of a wacky mad scientist. It's like Google X, but just kind of like a, well, I don't know. What if we just made it do this? And they just try it out. You know, it's weird that that is 
probably gonna happen soon. Or maybe we just have you. Well, there's only one of me, dude. We need like a billion of me. I don't want just me to be terrible. It, it is it is gonna be super interesting, by the way, as we start to see like multimodal attacks where you're combining like text and audio and image and things like that in ways that I think AI systems might expect, but I don't think humans would. And that's the fun of being a prompt engineer right now, hmm. right? I mean, that's basically that job yep. in a lot of ways. Kinda. I mean, you sit there and you're like, you're, t you're yeah. testing the model for yeah. any kind of, you know. Let's see what I can do. See what you can it's get, like you can prompt. Fun, small it's a small of piece of it. That's true. Yeah. But it's a, I think that's a fun job. You're making job. one piece of the Rube Goldberg machine. Yeah. If I could, yeah. yeah. If I, you know. Like, Not the marble. Yeah. Uh, all right, I want to do one more question for everybody, and then we'll open the room to Q&A. Uh, my suspicion is there's lots of good questions in this room. Um, and this is a big one, and it also might count as doing Grace's homework. Um, yes. What do we not, like, what do we know we don't know? What do we need more information about to do this well and to think about AI and cybersecurity in a helpful, productive way that, that really helps us protect ourselves, protect the AI, and use AI for all of the purposes that we really are excited about while we minimize the risk? Uh, you know, like everything we've never been able to use computers on before now? All of that. <laughs> all of it. Like, honestly, if you want to ask what we don't know, it's like an absurd, unthinkable, uh, like, like eldritch horror amount, to be honest. That's and it's kind of crazy that we're all just going with that as the fact. Actually, the NIST risk management framework original panels still kind of haunt me because they had this moment in the validation panel where they had like Kathy Baxter and some other people there just like, oh, we can validate this thing, that thing. And then uh, the moderator was like, what about large language models? You know, you validate those and all of them laughed. You're just like, of course not. That would be crazy to say <laughs> that we could validate one of these. And then everybody laughs and we all move on and then like, um, replace computers with these, you know? Or really, it's not even that, it's better than that. We replace computers with these operating what used to be AI, you know? It's like a whole system that we don't understand at all. So I think there's something that's like, like we have really unlocked um, like very exciting technology and a very powerful new age of computation and like a uh, human extension of the world. But at the same time, we have opened infinite unexplored space, right? And there's like a very deep need and opportunity in that. Right, like it's not just like a scary thing, and if anything, it's kind of like the great new age of exploration or something. Yeah. You know, if we can actually view it that way. Otherwise, it's horrific. We don't know, but it's like this is a reason for everybody to have a job figuring out what happens when we open up fuzzy math into the world for computers. You know, fuzzy math is fun. <laughs> so they tell me. Uh, I'll answer one that like I, I'm not sure it's a exactly answer your question but something that i think is potential but like we don't know if we could ever get there which is could um you know ai systems help drive towards you know formal methods for software um so providing mathematical proofs that a piece of software is secure would just be like in a in a in a millisecond completely transformative to software security right now i, th I don't think lms are well suited to that but could future other forms of ai technology get us there i think it would be really exciting and That'd be amazing. Yeah. I, I think I'm going to go a different direction. I think um, Grace sort of touched on this. I think there's a personnel issue that we have to think about a little bit too. Um, you know, engineers think in terms of math, right? Um, we're now talking in terms of probabilities, uh, you know, non-deterministic. Um, that means you don't know what the outcome is. That's not how an engineer normally thinks. It's got to be thinking about the question of risks actually requires an entirely different way of thinking um, when you get into AI models. And I'm not sure we've quite figured out how to actually do the education around that um, or trying to sort of teach people how to work with AI models. Um, and so I, I think... Practically, there's a lot of work to be done in making sure people actually understand what they're talking about and understand how to work with an AI model. Grace? I was just going to say thank you. I mean, I spent most of my life doing other people's homework, and someone just did it for this. is great. Thank you. Um, so, well, and, and, and you, you have a very formal mechanism to tell us what you want to know. So, yes, yes. Um, Coming soon. All right. So I know that we have a microphone. Uh, anyone have any questions for the panel? I see Prem. Thanks, um, and thanks for a very interesting panel. So a question I have is, is around the 2023 Biden National Cybersecurity Strategy and the emphasis that is very important there on cybersecurity software liability. And, and just curious for your the panel's thoughts in whichever direction you want to take on where that's going, how it's going to intersect with the, you know, sort of the problems we've been talking about and the potential to patch 
at scale, uh, and particularly how, how it f- could provide a floor for thinking about guardrails in the open source space in particular. I'm happy to jump in. I mean, I think we've been kind of dancing around this for a while. I think something that's been a little frustrating for, for me to watch as someone who's been in the security community a long time and the AI community less so is we've gotten to this point in kind of general software and general security that there is this recognition that you know uh, you, the vendors of widely used software and, and products need to be responsible and it's not you know, a fait accompli that breaches need to happen. Like there's very well known, uh, you know, software engineering practices that can can actually stop most breaches. And you know, we need to move to a place where, you know, when that's not happening, these vendors should be should be called out. Um, and what's been hard to watch is during the AI explosion, we've kind of, you know, not that the kind of, you know, longer tail existential risks, the kind of far out stuff. Not that we don't need to worry about that, but I think the balance has just gone there you know, swung so hard in that direction that we've kind of forgotten about the basics that, you know, models seem really cool, but it's really just software and models is one part of a very big stack usually. And, and if attackers want to do harm, they can target any parts of that stack uh, and are going to choose, you know, the, 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 the shortest path to reach their objective. And so as we're building out this, you know, AI industry and there's such a kind of a, an explosion there, um, I think it is really important that we're not just perpetuating the current dynamics into the future, but like we've learned how to do this. We've gotten before AI, we actually have gotten to this kind of consensus that like we need to do better and here's how we can do better. Just because we're going to market doesn't mean we should forget those things. Like that should be table stakes that everyone's doing that before we put products to market. You know, I, in terms of how that, you know, liability debate through the national cyber strategy is going to evolve, you know, I think who, who's to say, but I do hope that that kind of central insight that, you know, when there's breaches, we shouldn't always just immediately blame the end user. We should look at actually the upstream software. You know, I hope that that perpetuates into the AI era. So, and I'll tag that with one thing. Yeah, when we did the DEF CON generative AI red team, it became... Uh, incredibly apparent to me how important and useful it is for the hacker community and security like research community and to a lesser extent the normie cybersecurity community but definitely the first two to team up with AI research and AI implementation because the mindset of this like kind of inevitable unknowable failure and then like a real process that's designed to approach and understand and defend against that is um it's going to be so important because people are still going to be stuck in this mindset of like, well, how do we stop all the bad stuff from happening? It's like bad news. Um, it's all of the internet software. Obviously, you can't. Yeah. You know? Well, I mean, we've, we've been talking about how democratized it is and the non-deterministic nature and, and all of these all of these aspects make this even more challenging than some of the other discussions around liability. And I, I do think it's, it's an ongoing discussion. I am getting the signal that we are going to wrap up uh, so uh, thank you all. I suspect that we will all be around and happy to chat. Um, and uh, I hope you have a lovely rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.